Hello, we're Andy, the maniacal cinephile, and welcome to Boots to Reboots. It's winter 2021, and we're still in isolation. There's a storm approaching, and nobody trusts anybody now. According to the news. So I thought it'd be the perfect time to rewatch John Carpenter's 1982 version of The Thing. What? It started with Who Goes There, the 1938 sci-fi novella by John W. Campbell Jr. They recently discovered a 45-page longer version of the story titled Frozen Hell, which Blumhouse is turning into a movie. However, it was first adapted in 1951 as The Thing from Another World, written by Charles Lederer and directed by Christian Nyby. Although some claim it was really directed by producer Howard Hawks. It's similar to the debate of who really directed Poltergeist, Toby Hooper, or Steven Spielberg. This thing was a rather loose adaptation, changing the characters' names and most events. There's no sabotaged blood, no Blair to lock up, no McCready, or hot wire test. In the film, the Air Force and a group of scientific researchers discover an alien spaceship that recently crashed into the ice. Look at them. They all agree. The alien's penis is about yay big. In the book, it crashed 20 million years ago. The Antarctica setting has also been changed to the North Pole. Ooh, imagine the thing attacking Santa's village. They try to thaw out the spacecraft with a thermite charge, but accidentally blow it up. However, they do recover the alien pilot from the ice. Thawing revives the alien, which is completely different from the book. Instead of the book's telepathic being, which can assume the shape, memories, and personality of any living thing it devours, the first film goes with a plant-based alien that lumbers around like Frankenstein's monster and drinks blood. It sounds like you're trying to describe a vegetable, just as though you're describing some form of super Karen. Well, I do hate eating vegetables. Not me. I call them Meals on Wheels. Like other 1950 sci-fi movies, The Thing drew directly on two things. The fear of nuclear bombs, with scientists meddling with things better left alone, and the spread of communism. However, Carpenter brought back the shape-shifting creature and paranoia elements because who needs the Russians when we can turn on each other? Another adaptation of Who Goes There started in the mid-70s, going through several writers and directors, such as Kim Henkel and Toby Hooper. John Carpenter finally agreed to direct from a script by Bill Lancaster, simply titled The Thing. It was known that Carpenter was a fan of the story and original film, as he included footage of it in Halloween. Carpenter even copied the Burning Letters title card. However, Carpenter was adamant that his movie wasn't a direct remake of Hawk's film, but a more faithful adaptation of Campbell's story. So let's cross the thing off the list and see if it deserves the boot. We open with a flying saucer crashing on Earth. Remember to drink responsibly while exploring the cosmos. What? 
I'll drink some Pasmos. We then jump forward to Antarctica, 1982. A Norwegian helicopter shoots at and chases a sled dog to an American research station. Forget the gun, he should be using his mutant powers. Inside his shack, pilot RJ McCready drinks some J&B and gets into a fight with his computer chess game. I move, go to night six, checkmate. The voice of the chess game actually belongs to John Carpenter's ex-wife, Adrian Barbeau. Maybe he'll have better luck with the Rec Room's claw machine. If we were to zoom out, Mac is actually arguing with a blow-up doll. You can tell by her face that she's always yelling. Help! I had no chicken nuggies! Only fermented Jorgen Norgen Jorgen! The Americans then witness the Norwegian passenger blow himself up. It. All of a sudden, I feel a lot better about my morning. You see, officer, I was in my shack arguing with my sex doll when Norwegians started killing themselves. The Norwegian shoots Bennings in the leg and shouts at the Americans, but they can't understand him. However, Norwegian audiences did, and it spoiled the surprise. He says, get the hell away, it's not a dog. It's a thing. It's imitating a dog. It's not real. Get away, idiots. And we all know what happens to people in the theater who spoil the movie. Now everyone go back to texting. Nalls, will you turn that crap down? I'm trying to get some sleep. I was shot today. Well, nothing makes you sleepy like another bullet. McCready gets ready, <laughs> wearing a hat I'm pretty sure Carpenter made him wear, as a joke. Mac and Dr. Copper fly to investigate the Norwegian camp, only to find it destroyed. so many questions to ask. Most of the personnel are missing, except for a corpse in the radio room who committed suicide. The only clear radio station was Country. Mac then discovers a giant dug-up ice cube. All Mac needs now is a giant whiskey glass. Outside, they find the charred remains of some... thing. Is that a man in there? Or something? Maybe it's Uncle Owen and Aunt Baru. The pair return to Outpost 31 with the burned remains of a humanoid corpse that's two-faced. Reminds me of my lawyer. He died in a mysterious fire. <laughs> oh, sorry, it's wearing too much cologne. Ugh. <laughs> Their biologist, Blair, performs an autopsy and finds a normal set of internal organs. Heart, lungs, kidneys, liver, intestines. Seven testicles. Seem to be normal. Now, while Mac was at the Norwegian base, the dog thing was free to roam and entered someone's room. Which leads us to our first of many theories. Now, I always thought Norris was assimilated first, but according to co-producer Stuart Cohen, this was Palmer. But in reality, it's neither. To throw off the audience, Dick Warlock, <laughs> balls like this, Woo. stuntman and Halloween 2's Michael Myers stood in for the shot. Oh, I thought I recognized the shape. Now the hair and clothing looks more like Norris, the hallway outside Palmer's room is different, and the wall inside looks nothing like Palmer's room either. So it's either bad continuity or the filmmakers purposely tricked us. Whoa. If Palmer was first, then the thing spent most of the movie stoned. Wait. 
the joint. A small particle can take over an entire organism, but Palmer later shares a joint with Childs, and he's human. Palmer may be first, but it'd be less complicated if it were Norris. Maybe we're overthinking this. Confused yet? Ah, oh, crap. I lost our little buddy. Clark kennels the dog, which always hit its mark and delivered a great performance. The snow doggy was played by Jed. He was a good boy. However, the dog thing soon metamorphoses and absorbs the other sled dogs. <laughs> I take it back! He's not a good boy! In Japan, someone's getting off to this. This disturbance alerts the rest of the base. I don't know what the hell's in there, but it's weird and pissed off whatever it is. You know what? The doctor said the same thing during my ultrasound. It's got rabies! Poor sled doggies. But at least some of them live. To assert its dominance, the thing grows arms and challenges the men to a pull-up contest. Childs then uses a flamethrower to roast this hot dog. Ooh, that's the first real taste. We get of Rob Bottin's practical effects. There are layers upon layers of organisms this thing has imitated. The nicknamed pissed off cabbage that attacks childs is really 12 dog tongues and canine teeth. Bottin worked seven days a week during the 57 week production, often sleeping at the studio. He was only 22 years old and because of the fatigue and stress, he checked himself into a hospital when it was over. He was only 22? What the hell am I doing with my life? Because of the workload, Stan Winston was called in to help with the dog thing, but he refused any credit out of respect for Botine. In the end, Winston got a special thanks. There's a fan theory that half of the thing escaped out of the ceiling, but this has been debunked. There's no evidence of it, and our characters never show concern over a missing thing. Alright, now go melt some butter. Blair autopsies the remains and learns that it can perfectly imitate other organisms. Perfect imitations? Quick! Somebody run a blood test on Dana Carvey! I told you about it, he What? He's getting it, hello, he goes, right? Realizing the implications, Blair quickly becomes suspicious of the others. Did you notice anything strange about the dog? Anything at all? Strange? No. Well, it did have tentacles. How long were you alone with that dog? What the hell are you looking at me like that for? They found your dirty pictures, Clark! Recovered Norwegian footage, looking like it came straight out of the original, leads the Americans to a partially buried alien spacecraft. Oh my god! It's a matte painting! Norris then gives a shocking estimate for how old the ship is. I'd say the ice that's buried in is 100,000 years old, at least. Oh, so the only witness to the crash was Betty White. Lastly, they find a smaller, human-sized hole. Look! The alien wrote a message in the ice! While discussing the alien threat, Knowles reminds everyone about the importance of kitchen sanitation. No, what are you disrespectful men been tossing his dirty drawers in the kitchen trash can? Hate to tell you, Knowles, but your cooking wrecks their underwear. The torn up clothing is evidence of Norris or Palmer's assimilation the day before, but so far, only one of them can be the thing. And here's why. Mac was alone with Palmer and Norris at the dig site. If both of them were the thing at this point, they would have attacked McCready. Blair runs a computer projection. The hell? 
I thought this was Pong. He calculates one or more people are infected, and if the thing ever reached a city, the whole world would be infected in three years. Well, old boy, it's time to mercy kill the world. The bodies are placed in a storeroom when part of the creature assimilates Bennings. Ooh, but Windows walks in on him changing. Help! I'm all sticky! Bennings thing then makes a run for it, and he's tired. Uh, what's up, my fellow Earth dudes? McCready then torches the Bennings thing. For being a ginger. Resist the urge to kumbaya! Ah! McCready spots Blair, and we learn he has busted up all of the vehicles, destroyed the radio room, and killed the remaining sled dogs. They all die? That thing wanted to be an animal? That thing wanted to be us! Help me! I'd happily trade places with it! Come on, man. You don't want to hurt anybody. I'll kill you! Jeez. You'd think Childs were a doctor telling Blair to exercise. The men charge and subdue the wild Blair, like they do at catering. They then drag him out and lock him in the tool shed. There's a good chance Blair was human before the outburst, and here's why. The original director, Christian Nyby, hated the remake. He said, if you want blood, go to the slaughterhouse. All in all, it's a terrific commercial for J&B Scotch. That insult actually made me pay attention to all of the drinking shots in the movie. Notice that earlier, Blair was drinking vodka. As one does before a rampage. And later, inside the tool shed, Mac takes a drink from Blair's bottle. Mac is still human, therefore Blair was human while running his projection. Watch Clark, and watch him close, do you hear me? Huh. Those morning poops are about to get awkward. To figure out who is human, Copper suggests a blood serum test. Copper will mix each member's blood with uncontaminated blood to see if there's a reaction. Ooh, I can collect their blood. I'll go get my bucket and hammer. Gary gives Copper the keys, who discovers that the blood bags have been destroyed. Since Gary and Copper were the only ones who had access to the blood storage, they are no longer trusted. I don't know about Copper, but I give you my word I did not go near that blood. And I give you my word, I did not go near that chocolate. This leads to our next mystery. The keys play an important part here. We know Windows got the keys from Gary and we can hear him drop them after witnessing the Bennings assimilation. A lot of fans point their fingers at Palmer or Norris, but both are present during Benning's cremation. Everyone is, except Blair. He's locked himself in his room and he won't answer the door. Where's Blair? I can't find Blair. Later, during Blair's outburst, Norris is present, but Palmer is missing. So Palmer could be off sabotaging the blood. There's just one problem. The keys are already back on Gary's belt at this point. Between Windows dropping the keys and them reappearing back on Gary's belt, everyone is accounted for in the rec room. Except Blair. Remember, the thing gains the memories and knowledge of its victim. Palmer is a mechanic and Norris is a geologist. Their assimilations probably wouldn't think of the blood. So who sabotaged the blood? who is the biologist who has been missing and sabotaging everything else. Windows? What? No, Blair! <laughs> Gary tries to give command over to Norris, who refuses. Norris, I can't see anybody objecting to you. I'm sorry, fellas, but I, I, I'm not up to it. Either Norris is worried about his heart condition, or Norris Thing doesn't want to draw too much attention to itself. Also, notice that everyone is bickering, but in the background, Palmer is wearing earbuds 
and burning a hole in the back of Fuke's head. Humans! I mean, guys, I'm trying to listen to music! Outside, Mac burns the blood and gives a speech. I know I'm human. But the thing in his pants is a monster. If you were all these things, then you'd just attack me right now. So some of you are still human. A storm hits them for 48 hours, and Mac decides to make a secret recording. I think it rips through your clothes when it takes you over. Windows found some shredded long johns, but the name tag was missing. Now if Nalls found Palmer's shredded long johns in the kitchen, then these new long johns must belong to Norris, or most likely Blair. This 48 hour gap would have been the perfect time to assimilate someone. Nobody, nobody trusts anybody now. We're all very tired. The slogan for this past year. McCready checks on Fuchs, who has a good idea. If a small particle of this thing is enough to take over an entire organism, then everyone should prepare their own meals, and I suggest we only eat out of cans. A moment later, the fuse is blown, and someone startles Fuchs. Who's that? Pay attention to that distinct sound. We hear it again. Only once. Fuchs chases the person outside, and discovers some torn up clothing belonging to... R.J. McCready. Would have been funnier if it was his torn up sex doll. The power was out for an hour, and Fuchs is missing, so McCready, Windows, and Nalls search for him. Outside, they find Fuchs's corpse burnt to a crisp. Oh, for Fuchs' sake! This leads us to yet another mystery. The men suggest the thing tried to assimilate Fuchs, so he committed suicide. A mysterious suicide? Where were the Clintons? However, I think he was murdered! But by who? At this time, Palmer and Norris should be in the rec room with the others. In the script, Palmer is busy working on the generator. Working in electrical, eh? Likely story imposter? If that sound is a clue, then Blair Thing is the only one with enough time to get Max clothing, kill the power, kill Fuchs, and then hide the clothing again in Max shack. In the novel and a early draft of the script, a window was broken from the outside. Again, likely Blair, and Fuchs was impaled to a door with a shovel. So definitely not a suicide. Goodbye, cruel world! Ah! Ah, son of a... The snowstorm must have killed the power. I'll be right back. When the men visit the tool shed, there's something off about Blair. I don't want to stay out here anymore. I want to come back inside. It's only because inside is where they keep all the good nooses. Funny things. I hear funny things out here. Ooh, I hope it's the penguins from Madagascar. I'm all right. I'm much better. And I won't harm anybody. Oh, tell that to your horse's back. <laughs> By now, Blair has to be the thing. And the change in attitude is the alien wanting to keep its privacy. Windows returns to base while McCready and Nalls investigate why the light is on in McCready's shack. On their return, Nalls abandons him in the snowstorm, believing he has been assimilated after finding Mac's torn clothing behind his furnace. The men debate whether to allow McCready inside. The players are against each other! You guys better not be planning my surprise party in there! He's gonna be really embarrassed when he remembers it's push instead of pull. However, the ghostly Mac manages to break in and hold off the group with dynamite. Anyone messes with me and the whole camp goes. Goes where? Do they have a kid's menu? During a brief struggle, Norris appears to suffer a heart attack. I'm not breathing! Well, pick one. Is it his heart or his lungs? You're gonna have to sleep sometime, McCready. I'm a real light sleeper, child. For all we know, He's sleeping right now! So they untie Copper, who attempts to defibrillate Norris. 
there. Ah! Carpenter must have seen Alien's chestburster scene and said, Hold my thing. For this shot, a double amputee stand-in was used wearing a copper mask. Ugh, ah! oh, God, it's me full of pasta at the Olive Garden. <laughs> when they look nothing like the photo on their dating profile. McCready incinerates the Norris thing, but the creature is becoming a huge pain in the neck and tries to escape. <laughs> Doctor visits. They can be a drag. The Norris thing then sprouts legs and more eyes. The thing is probably hoping Pennywise doesn't rip it off in 40 years. Still not as big as the spiders in Australia. If that place even exists. Well, good day, sirs. I'll head on out. You gotta be fucking kidding. Me, every time they announce another remake. <laughs> you probably could have crushed it with a really big shoe. Oh, no. When a spider's that big, you kill it with fire! <laughs> when it said... <laughs> I've been there. And right there is some of the best practical effects in horror. Effects? Are you sure Mr. Carpenter didn't hire a real alien? If Norris wasn't the first to be assimilated, then we don't really know when he was. Norris refused to leadership earlier and later has chest pains. Were these pains from his heart condition? or something else. Most likely, Norris was the victim of a single cell infection growing inside him, and the heart attack was the thing finally taking over. According to the tagline, man is the warmest place to hide. That always sounded dirty, like it's for the porn parody. McCready wants everyone tied up, which Childs refuses. They always throw a fit before you tie him up. He ain't tying me up. Then I'll have to kill you, Childs. Then kill me. When you get called into work, on your day off. He's stubborn. No wonder he's called Childs. Here's for watching me poo! Now with everyone tied up, Matt goes over his plan. He learned from the Norris Thing's head that every part of the Thing is an individual life form with its own survival instinct. He'll now test everyone's blood to see if it runs from a heated piece of wire. For years, this is how Wilford Brimley tested his blood sugar. Diabetes. 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 Windows, wiping it on your pants doesn't make it clean. You gotta spit on it. Yeah, in the book, at least they used alcohol. When I get older, I'm gonna tell... someone's grandkids that this was a COVID test. While still somewhat relatable today, allusions were drawn between the blood test scene and the HIV epidemic that started in 1981. Now well, I'll show you what I already know. Smashing a 150-year-old guitar instead of the replica is bad. Give me that guitar. Music time's over. Whoa! 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 It's a crock of shit. He says the same thing after every magic trick. It's a crock of shit. One by one, Mac tests the group, even those who are dead like Clark. And Clark was human, huh? Which makes you a murderer, don't it? Oh, I'm sorry, Childs. What were you saying when McCready was outside freezing to death? Childs, what if we're wrong about him? Why then we're wrong? 
Keith David, always being difficult. Like the time he got into a six-minute fistfight with Roddy Piper just because he wouldn't put on the glasses. Try these on. Put these on. Hey! <laughs> Either put on these glasses or start eating that trash can. Put on the glasses. Take a look. Put them on. <laughs> When Rowdy Roddy Piper tells you to do something, just do it. Give me that smoke, would ya? Yeah! This is pure nonsense. Doesn't prove a thing. Well, actually, it does prove a thing, as everyone passes. Except Palmer. <laughs> I'm in danger! <laughs> Being tied to the thing makes the men's blood run cold, and other blood just... RUN! <laughs> According to cinematographer Dean Cundy, a clue was the lack of light in Palmer's eyes during this shot. Now exposed, Palmer Thing transforms and breaks free of his bonds like David, the dwarf. I can break these cuffs. You can't break those cuffs. <laughs> Palmer's face splits open, and because Windows is not responding, the Thing chows down. Palmer Thing is high! With a deadly case of the munchies! <laughs> Yeehaw! Ride em, cowboy! <laughs> Impressive! Windows was able to stay on for over eight seconds. McCready is finally able to torch the thing, and it's an impressive fire stunt. <laughs> Pay attention to Kurt Russell here. The dynamite explosion was a lot bigger than expected and knocks him back. Maybe I shouldn't have escaped New York. The original also had one of the scariest fire stunts I've seen. They're just throwing buckets of gas or kerosene on the thing and it's splashing everywhere. Matt destroys Windows, now infected with a virus. If only Windows had a firewall. In the book, the blood test reveals that Commander Gary is an alien. However, in Carpenter's version, Gary is human. I'd rather not spend the rest of this winter tied to this fucking couch! But he is willing to settle for a lazy boy recliner. A sleepy child's is left on guard while the others go to test Blair. We're going out to give Blair the test. If he tries to make it back here and we're not with him, burn him. Make fun of his bald head or something. The door to the shed is open and Blair is missing. Some loose floorboards cover up a secret underground tunnel. Hey Blair, you down there? We got something for you. The only way he'll come running is for a bowl of Quaker Oats. Every day should start with Quaker Oats. Blair's been busy out here all by himself. Uh-oh. Don't tell me Blair found Max blow-up doll. What? No, you pervert! Blair's been building a flying saucer! Will the ladies like a man with wheels? Wait, does a saucer have wheels? In the book, Blair is also the thing. And must have been early on. Instead of two days, he had a week to sneak around and build the ship. The other things were simply decoys, so Blair Thing could go about its business in the privacy of the tool shed. In the movie, we're unsure when Blair became the Thing. There's a popular theory it happened when he touched the Thing with a pencil and then stuck it to his lips. But if you look closely, he never actually touches the corpse with the pencil, and him putting it to his lips wasn't scripted and a mistake by the actor. So debunked! 
Blair could have been assimilated in the shed, but with everyone on high alert and the storm, that'd be difficult to do. However it happened, it likely occurred when Blair locked himself in his bedroom, or at the start of his rampage. In the book and early draft of the script, the remaining sled dogs were imitations, and could have fought back when killed. Remember, it tears your clothing. A simple way to look at it is yellow shirt Blair, white shirt Blair Thing. The Thing was imitating and finishing Blair's outburst. Either way, it's tragic that the brains of Outpost 31 became the Thing he feared most. A diabetic. While the men blow up the ship, Childs is missing from his post, only to be spotted a moment later running out into the storm. Seconds later, the power generator is destroyed. In a few hours, it'll be a hundred below, and the thing will have frozen again. The men realize this ends only one way. They die. Too bad they're not in the Carpenter movie. They live. McCready, Gary, and Nalls decide to warm things up around the station before heading downstairs into the generator room. The generator's gone. Any way we can fix it. It's gone, McCready. Well, did it leave a note saying when it'll be back? As they set explosives, Blair surprises Commander Gary with a fatal fingering. What? Ouch. Good thing Blair was a biologist, and not a proctologist. Carpenter asked Brimley what he was thinking about during this shot, and he replied, Picking up my laundry. The cleaners must have lost his mustache. Nalls looks for Gary, and we never see him again. In the script, Nalls slits his throat with a slab of wood when cornered in a bathroom stall, but his death changed. There are storyboards of Nalls bursting out of the floor with Blair Thing, but it was cut due to financial and time constraints. In the end, Nalls dies off screen. Cause of death, lack of money. With only Mac left, Blair Thing slithers towards him like a graboid from Tremors. Good morning. I'm Wilfred Brimley, and I'd like to talk to you for a few minutes about diabetes. The thing destroys the detonator before rising up, and a dog emerges from its stomach. Where in Antarctica did he get Chinese takeout? McCready grabs a stick of dynamite, does a completely necessary flip, and blows up the place. But not before the thing gets mean. For decades, we've been debating over the ambiguous ending. Perhaps the biggest mystery is who, if anyone, is the thing by the end. Everyone asks, who is the thing? But nobody ever asks, how is the thing? As the station burns, McCready sits and goes to take a drink when Childs reappears. Where were you, Childs? Thought I saw Blair. I went out after him. Got lost in the storm. Exhausted and slowly freezing to death, they shrug off their distrust and share a bottle of whiskey while Mac laughs to himself. <laughs> First, Let's debunk some popular theories. Number one, Childs is the thing because he's really drinking gasoline. Mac goes to take a sip of the whiskey himself before Childs appears. Plus, the thing gains the memories and knowledge of those it assimilates. The thing would know if it were drinking gas. Debunked! Number two, Childs is the thing because his breath does not fog up. Now thanks to high definition, you can see that Childs does have some visible breath. Childs isn't lit as well as McCready, and he's been out in the storm this whole time, so internally, he wouldn't be as warm as Mac. Plus, when Bennings is assimilated, we clearly see the thing's breath. 
So foggy breath isn't a clue. Debunked! In LA, the sets were refrigerated to 40 degrees. They had to drink hot coffee to see their breath. If you want to see your own breath, stop brushing your teeth. I always liked the idea of both men being human, but upon analyzing every scene of this movie, there is a strong case that Childs is the thing. And I don't care about any comic book or video game that came later. I only care about what existed in 1982. Although Mr. Russell did play a shape-shifting alien in Guardians of the Galaxy. Remember, we saw Childs nodding off at his post. He's wearing a dark blue coat, and there's another dark blue coat behind him. A moment later, a very deliberate shot shows us the steps down to the generator. Doors open off to the right, plus Childs and the other blue coat are missing. Remember, the thing rips through your clothing. The blue coat is replaced with a beige coat, similar to the one Blair wears and isn't wearing later. Childs then reappears by the door and runs out into the storm. Now, Childs claims he left his post because he saw Blair outside and went after him. But that story doesn't add up. Right after Childs runs out into the storm, the generator is blown. That means Blair wasn't running around outside. Blair was downstairs, destroying the generator. Childs is lying. Most likely, Childs Thing ran off to freeze itself. Childs hasn't trusted McCready for half the movie, so unless he had a change of heart, the Thing has possibly exposed itself by sharing a drink and showing no concern for infection. Eh, give me liquor, or give me death. That is why McCready laughs. It failed a simple test. In the script, and Kurt Russell has confirmed that Mac has a flamethrower under his blanket. To me, it'd be fitting if Mac ended the movie how he began, by giving a drink to, and frying, the cheating bitch. Cheating bitch. The only hiccup to my theory is that Childs still has his earring. A major plot point of the prequel is that the Thing cannot recreate inorganic matter, like the fillings in your teeth. The Kate character later discovers Carter has been assimilated because of his missing earring. However, the prequel came out 30 years later. If you want to include it, then the Thing could have learned from that mistake and simply put Child's earring back in. It's a lot easier than putting fillings back in. I've tried. Why do you think I drink so much? In the end, there is no one answer. And that's the point. The thing wouldn't be as fun and we wouldn't be talking about it decades later if there was a clear ending. It's up to each of us to theorize what happens. It's one of the best films about paranoia and the erosion of trust. Including the prequel, The Thing Organism took over two research facilities and killed 28 people. I would tell you how many dogs, but thankfully, I can't count. One is too many. Ugh! Ugh! I think I've done more dissecting in this movie than Blair. The Thing was released on June 25th, 1982. It was a box office and critical failure. Some theorize it did so poorly because its bleak tone and gory effects competed with the family-friendly E.T., which came out two weeks earlier. It also didn't help that The Thing came out the same day as Blade Runner. This was Carpenter's first studio picture, but the studio canceled their multi-picture deal with him, and he lost projects like Firestarter. Carpenter still made great films, but his career would have been a lot different had The Thing been a hit. Today, it's considered a milestone of the horror genre, and one of the best remakes ever. The effects are way ahead of the original, which couldn't use any close-ups of the thing because the makeup was so bad. However, 
that did make the creature somewhat mysterious. 1982's The Thing is a classic because of Lancaster's writing, Carpenter's directing, Cundy's cinematography, Oteen's practical effects, the ensemble cast, the tone, the atmosphere, and Ennio Morricone's score. Ennio Macaroni's music reminds me of our mother's heartbeat. Haunting. So does The Thing deserve the boot? Frozen hell no! It's a great adaptation. It's a great remake. It's a great Carpenter film. It's a great horror film. It's just a great film, period. We are still analyzing and talking about it to this day. So let's discuss some theories in the comments below. This has been Andy, the Maniacal Cinephile. Thanks for liking and subscribing. And see you next time. Again? Damn these Midwest winters. Who goes there? Ahoy hoy, my good boy! Dr. Adquitus? Well, I haven't seen you all year. Wait. How'd you get here in the storm? <laughs> Wait! It's okay! He got the vaccine!